lot of money from big corporations and big banks. Democrat Tim Canova challenging Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz in the Democratic primary, and he's making some headway. He is with us live. Venezuela in crisis, inflation and crime are way up. Food, pharmaceuticals, political freedom way down. South Florida's Venezuelan community very concerned. I was very encouraged with what I heard from Donald Trump. House Speaker Paul Ryan meets with Donald Trump but does not endorse him. Can the Republican Party unite behind Trump? We'll ask our round two. Good morning, welcome, glad you could join us. Glenna is off today. We have a couple of topics on our agenda, including the deteriorating state of Venezuela. We're gonna talk with some local exile leaders about that coming up. But first, a look at an unusual challenge to a popular member of Congress. First time candidate Tim Canova is running against Representative Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Canova has put together an impressive campaign team. He has raised a million dollars, serious money. He is challenging the Democratic incumbent, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, who also chairs the Democratic National Committee. She is a political pro who has served in Congress for 12 years and the state legislature before that. Well entrenched, she now represents the 23rd Congressional District. Here is a map of that district. It stretches from southern Broward down into northeastern Miami-Dade, Aventura, then down into Miami Beach. It is a heavily Democratic district that elected and then re-elected Wasserman Schultz six times. Tim Canova is running for the Democratic nomination in the 23rd CD. He's a law professor at Nova Southeastern University. He describes himself as a progressive and he once advised Bernie Sanders. Tim Canova, welcome. Thank you. So glad to have you come in. Nice to be here with you. Um, some political pundits would say a first time candidate running against an entrenched veteran, popular uh, and well-financed uh, a member of Congress, been there 12 years. Mm -hmm. Do you have a death wish? I mean, do you have a I'll, death wish? I'll, I'll tell you, I don't think she's half as popular as the pundits think. She's never had a, a primary uh, opponent in any of her races for Congress. and well, Not a serious opponent, I think. In, in the primaries, no, she hasn't. Yeah. She, and she's had an easy uh, district as far as uh, these are Democratic districts. Uh, she hasn't had to worry about a Republican yeah. opponent. Right. So the basic question here, why are you running? Why do you think you're more qualified to serve than she? I, I'm a constituent of hers, and I've been looking at her record and have been very displeased with her representation of the district. I, I think we do need new leadership, and I think I could provide better representation. Yeah. I got involved last summer with the Citizens Trade Campaign, lobbying the entire Florida congressional delegation against the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Yeah. And we got nowhere with her office, not even a response, and she was the only Democrat in Florida's House delegation to vote to fast track this terrible trade agreement. All right, L let's be clear. Um, on a lot of social issues, on gay marriage, LGBT issues, uh, maybe the new policy on transgender students, the way should be, they should be treated. On these kinds of issues, you don't really take exception I, I, to Debbie Wasserman in Schultz, In fact, do you? I, I often applaud her for her position on these issues. Uh, the issues that I'm challenging her is really the influence of corporate money. She's been taking millions of dollars from the largest corporations and Wall Street banks and this is, is not just my opinion. Uh, the Miami Herald did a PolitiFact check, yeah. and they confirmed this. Well, it's one thing, it's one thing, Professor Canova, to take money. It's mm -hmm. another thing, then, to vote the way the people who gave you the money <laughs> want you to vote. Exactly. Are you saying that she has voted uh, according to the wishes of the payday lending industry? <laughs> this ex that is exactly, For example? What, exactly what I'm saying. So I mentioned the Trans-Pacific Partnership. She took over $300,000 from corporate groups that support the Trans-Pacific Partnership just in the last congressional cycle. And she took hardly any money from groups against it. She voted for the TPP or to fast track the TPP. Yeah, fast track TPP. She's been pushing a Republican bill that would prevent President Obama's Consumer Financial Protection Bureau from regulating payday loans. Well, she has recently, I don't have it in front of me, but she did co-sponsor another bill that sort of comes back at the payday lending industry the, the, uh, to, to prove, she, I talked with her about this a few weeks ago, and she says that she is all in favor of tough regulation of payday lenders. You know, it's a lot of talk. The bill that she's gotten behind would probably be uh, helpful to the payday lending industry. All it does is try to regulate online payday loans. Yeah. Probably it's being pushed by the 
uh, payday loan companies that are actually on the ground and, and, and that are yeah. not online. Yeah. Well, she also says that, and she was a member of the state House of Representatives and then the state Senate, she says during that period, the Florida legislature, and they did pass a pretty tough payday lending regulation law, and she says that the, she's glad that they did and she supported it. I would beg to differ. This law is 15 years old, as if nothing has changed in 15 years. There's no interest rate cap, and the Florida Consumer Alliance and civil rights groups have all said that under Florida's payday lending law, borrowers are paying over 300 percent interest and being stuck in a cycle of debt. Yeah, well, she says that's a model, should be a model for the country. It's a terrible model and, and really it is shilling for the payday lending industry. Well she did take, I believe, I've seen the figure, uh, $50,000 from various payday lending companies right. uh, and she says this didn't influence her vote. Well let me, let me say this, in addition to the payday lending industry, she's uh, voted against the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau from issuing regulations against racial redlining of auto loans. Now who are behind the payday lenders and the auto loans? It's big Wall Street banks that provide mm -hmm. the lines of credit, that take the auto loans and secure it, bundle right. them together and securitize right. them. She's been taking hundreds of thousands of dollars from these big Wall Street banks, and this is a Wall Street agenda. All right, well, uh, Professor Canova, you have been taking uh, thousands of contributions from mm -hmm. people who obviously believe in you, believe in your campaign. All these contributions are legal. That's not the question. Mm -hmm. The question is, uh, are these people who live in the 23rd Congressional District, or who are the people who have contributed to you? Well, the people who have contributed to me are working folks who have given an average of less than $19 a contribution. And, while, and we've gotten more than 50,000 contributions now. And where are they and, from? And while they're from all over the country, I'm proud to take contributions from real live human beings around the country, whereas my opponent is taking contributions from people chartered in the state of Delaware and elsewhere, from corporations. I'm not taking a single penny from yeah. any corporate And you also interest. don't believe in super PACs or anything like that. And you also don't believe in the, uh, don't uh, adhere to the, well, you adhere to Citizens United decision from the Supreme Court. You just simply don't believe that you should take money from super PACs. Uh, I refuse to take any corporate PAC money at all. And, you know, my opponent's campaign has criticized us for taking money from around the country. She's a national leader. And the fact that we've raised a million dollars and a lot of it from outside of the state is a real indictment of her national leadership. How, how so? To the degree that folks in Iowa or Alaska or New Hampshire or any other state in the country yeah. are, are, are contributing to my campaign in not small measure because they feel that she's been a failed leader at the De Democratic National Committee. When we spoke earlier in your campaign office in Hollywood uh, on Tuesday of this week, you said that some, maybe many, of your contributors are also the people who have given money to Bernie Sanders. He has done extremely well with contributions, and some of that seems to have spilled over to you. So are a lot of these people Sanders supporters? I imagine they are. Uh, you know, I don't ask folks who they support for a president when they contribute to my campaign. Right. There are a lot of similarities in my domestic agenda to Bernie Sanders. Uh, you know, we both have uh, called for uh, not taking corporate money, and we have a progressive agenda, uh, right. both Sanders and I, but I'm getting an awful lot of support from people who support Hillary Clinton. Right. And on issue after issue, I line up closer to Hillary Clinton than does Wasserman Schultz. Well, in fact, on Israel, you explained to me earlier, you're not very happy with the position that Bernie Sanders has taken and the fact that he didn't speak to AIPAC. Well, this is true. And, you know, you saw the, the presidential debate, the Democratic debate in New York, when uh, Senator Sanders said he was 100 percent behind Israel. Mm -hmm. And he criticized Israel for what he called a disproportionate response um, to Hamas in Gaza. Right. I think you really have to call Hamas out for the disproportionate provocations. Uh, unless you live in Israel, you really don't know what it's like to have to live under the threat it, of those it, missiles. And, and I believe at one point you've told me you did live in Israel. Is that right? That is right. I lived there for several months when I was a much younger man, worked on a kibbutz, and I've been back half a dozen times. Uh, the last couple of times were for academic programs. Uh, I was a fellow with the Foundation for Defense of Democracy, so right, I'm very so you committed have some to some firsthand knowledge of Israel. And, right. and I should say I'm critical yeah. of the the Iran agreement, of the nuclear the deal. The nuclear deal. Yeah. All right. Um, we have only about less than a minute left, but I have to ask you, I know that you have sent 
uh, a number, maybe three invitations yeah. to Representative Wasserman Schultz to debate. And yes. I want to say right now, uh, I'm inviting you to appear with her on this program. Uh, August 7th or 14th would be a good date. And I've sent those dates uh, to her campaign. I'm waiting to hear back, but will you appear here for a debate? Absolutely, I'll appear. I'll clear my calendar for, for either of those dates. I, I, sure. I am trying to, to, to debate Debbie Wasserman Schultz, and she seems to be dodging debates. Well, we will find out if she does, but um, uh, anyway, the 7th and 14th, whatever date uh, she agrees to, and if you agree to it, then we'll see you here. I look forward Tim to it. Tim Canova, thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Michael. All right. Coming up next, the sad and deteriorating state of Venezuela. It is falling apart. That's a tremendous concern for Venezuelans who live in South Florida, and we'll speak to two of them after the break. South Florida has several exile communities. Cubans, of course, make up the largest one, Colombians another. We've got a lot of Haitians too, and one of the newest and fastest growing groups is Venezuelans. They began leaving their country in large numbers after Hugo Chavez took power and began his Bolivarian revolution. The exodus continued after his death three years ago, and that brought the rise of Nicolas Maduro as the president. His tenure has been, I think by any measure, a political and economic disaster. Elena Poleo has documented that disaster as a reporter for the Miami Herald, El Nuevo Herald, and the Sun Sentinel. She has been a government spokesperson in Miami, and Doral now heads her own company, Influence Communications. Ernesto Ackerman is a native of Venezuela who is an architect by training, a designer of hospitals, and a businessman in Miami for many years. He created Independent Venezuelan American Citizens back in 2003. It is a nonprofit that helps Venezuelan immigrants become U.S. citizens. Elena, Ernesto, bienvenidos. Welcome. Glad you're here to talk about a really important topic to us in South Florida. Elena, um, the news from Venezuela just keeps getting worse and worse, it seems, every day, every week. Yes, unfortunately, that is the truth. For those of us that are outside of our country, it's very, very painful to watch the way that the events are unfolding. Um, and we try to do what we can, and Ernesto has done such an amazing job um, representing the Venezuelan American community that lives in South Florida, which is growing and growing, unfortunately, because we don't yeah. really want to leave our country. Right. Ernesto, generally, give me an estimate. How many Venezuelans have moved to South Florida over the last few it's years? It's a very difficult number to, to say, but uh, figures is around 200, 250,000 wow. uh, Venezuelans. And we need to say that Venezuelans never left left the country. They, we loved to live there. It was a, such a good place to go. Yeah. People from all over Latin America went to Venezuela, and now we have to leave our country. Well, it was among the most advanced countries uh, in Latin America for many years, a first world country. Right. Now, uh, Elena, I'd have to say in many ways it's a third world country. It's behind third world. I think we're moving beyond that to fourth world. I mean, um, right now, there is absolutely no food, and we're talking about, we're not talking about the steak, you know, expensive steakhouses or clothes. We're talking about you can't find baby food. You can't find milk for babies. You can't find chicken. You can't find flour, which is a staple. Corn flour is a staple of Venezuelan food right. for, for low-income and middle-income people, the same. You can't find uh, medicine. People are dying in hospitals because there's yeah. no, nothing to clean, sterilize, the instruments with babies are dying in hospitals because there's no formula and this is talking about a country that has oil basically popping out of the ground right. this is a really it's one of the most oil rich i think the fifth maybe most oil rich co uh, country they in the, the world biggest but reserve in the, world. the biggest reserves and yet of course the price of oil has fallen and it's a, and even when it was high uh, Chavez never really accounted for all these oil riches. I mean, the money was squandered on many things. Nobody knows where it went. Well, that was the big corruption in the government that was giving away presents to all the countries to have their yeah, uh, Cuba uh, among support. others. Yes, Cuba especially. 
And uh, right now, we don't have any money. Uh, everything is, uh, as Elena said, yeah. she really explained very well what the situation there. Right. Well, what is going to be, or what can you think the United States should be doing to help remedy the situation? I mean, I know I talked to John Kerry a couple of weeks ago, and he said, we monitor this. We don't want a rogue nation right. within this hemisphere, but that's what it's become. Exactly, that is what has become. Um, in December, there were the parliamentary elections, um, the Congress elections, and the opposition did win that by quite a landslide. So that is a show that people are getting tired of this government. Now, as a Venezuelan, I would like to see the, the solution come from Venezuelans, yeah. not from outside forces. That is what we're hoping. It, it can't be sustained if it's not from Venezuelans agreed, in the country. Agreed, but there does need to be an international support for this change mm -hmm. um, from countries in the hemisphere. Now, Venezuela, so a lot of that money that you're talking about, a lot of that oil money became buy money. They were using it to purchase the support of nations in Latin America mm -hmm. and also in Iran and China. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at um, a hemisphere that was supportive of the Chavez government. However, now that there's no money left, things are changing right. within the hemisphere. Right, and Ernesto, we have read, I think, uh, in the last two days that the Organization of American States, the Venezuelan opposition has gone and said uh, this country, our country, signed on to the principles of the OAS, but they're not living up to them. If they don't live up to them, they should be expelled from well, the OAS. When you ask what the United States can do, there is two major things that the United States can do. One is support us in the OAS to, to apply the chapter, the democratic chapter. Mm -hmm. And the second one, we want more sanctions. We want more people of the government of Chavez sanctioning this country. We need to see Sanction what by whom? By the government of the United States. So the violators of human rights in Venezuela yeah. get punished in this country. They, they uh, has to be, uh, we need to see what is the money that they stole from the Venezuelan government, yeah. uh, people who did the violation of human rights, uh, all this has to be punished in this country because right. this is a country of law. Yeah, but uh, Helena, uh, on that subject, mm -hmm. uh, I know that uh, Representative Mario diaz balart Senator Marco Rubio have been among the leaders in Congress in trying to impose sanctions, freeze bank accounts of That's Venezuelans right. who have bought expensive properties in Miami, expensive condos, they come here they, they have a lot of money. And when which we is talk about money, we are talking about millions and millions and millions. We're not talking yeah. about, you know, $20,000, maybe $1 million. We are talking about an exorbitant amount of millions of dollars that have been moved out of the Venezuelan economy, right. moved out of the oil industry that sustained our country for so many decades. Now, that oil industry has been completely abandoned, and there have been no upgrades. The plants are constantly malfunctioning. Yeah. So that is a huge issue. And so uh, not only have oil prices been going down, but oil production has been decreasing because ha they have not invested in this very yeah. important industry in our country. Yeah. By the way, uh, if anybody uh, who is watching would like to read more, there's an excellent article you can find online from the latest Atlantic. It's called Venezuela is Falling Apart, and it is very depressing. Um, uh, Ernesto, when you think about some brave opposition leaders like Leopoldo Lopez, who uh, is in prison, really, on trumped-up charges of being unpatriotic, trying to bring down the government. Uh, who's going to lead the opposition without people like Lopez? Well, we have people. We have the MUD, the uh, Mesa de la Unidad in Venezuela, and that groups all the political parties in Venezuela. So we have leaders. Uh, it's very bad le that Leopold, a, a guy like Leopoldo Lopez, who did nothing, He's now in jail already for over two years. Uh, this is the kind of government uh, is going on in Venezuela. Right now, there is six National Assembly guys that went to, to ask for the OAS, for the Democratic chapter. Yeah. They want to uh, uh, judge them like uh, traitors to the country. That's 30 They're years They're being called jail. traitors for going to the OAS. Well, but they want to take them to court, and that's 30 years of, of wow. jail if they get the... Uh, uh, yeah. Which they uh, would, of course, because of all, course. Um, again, there is no separation of power, so all the courts are 
basically they're controlled, they're yeah. stacked by the government. So there is absolutely no state of law in Venezuela. You can't say, well, this, I'll take it to the courts because the courts are completely owned by the government and there is no. absolutely no recourse. And the only recourse that people have is what we've been doing. We saw yesterday and this past week, which is going out to the streets and protesting. Yeah. But of course, the government <laughs> has the weapons and they will get violent. And that is what's very difficult. Well, it's a terrible situation and uh, our sympathies go out to the people of Venezuela and also to the Venezuelans who live here and are watching this, uh, their own country deteriorate. Elena Poleo, always good to see you. Ernesto thank Ackerman, thank you very much thank for you coming. Thank you for having us. All right, after the break, we are going to take it all to our powerhouse roundtable. It is that time again, the time to take a closer look at the week's top news stories and get some informed opinion and analysis. With our roundtable, we've got a good one for you this morning. Mark Caputo covers Florida for Politico, the go-to website for politics, and he writes the Politico Florida playbook that lands in our email early this morning, even one this morning. Thank you very much. Dr. Marvin Dunn is a psychologist. He taught for many years at FIU. He is an accomplished writer civic activist and has a new book coming out. And a roundtable regular Marlon Hill, Miami attorney with the Hamilton Miller and Bertha Cell firm. He is a past president of the Caribbean Bar Association and does radio as well. To all of you, good morning. Uh, we are kind of testosterone heavy here, but I think we can get through it. I think uh, Glenna, I saw her at the ball and chain last night. Oh, you did? Havana. We ran into her there. I, I, think, well. I think she got stuck. TMI. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Mark, let me begin with you. Uh, you just heard, I think, uh, Tim Canova present his case uh, in the Democratic primary. Uh, does he have a death wish? I mean, here you are running against this immensely uh, popular and, and, and powerful, influential member of Congress, but, you know, he's got, he's got a million bucks. Well, if, he, he, if he's got a death wish, he's doing the right kind of suicide bombing. <laughs> uh, you know, your ability to raise a million dollars as, as a complete unknown is impressive. There's one interesting thing that you see in our politics is that if you pick the right opponent, you can suddenly become very popular. And Debbie Wasserman Schultz, for a variety of reasons, is the right opponent. The problem that Canova is going to have is the actual district, uh, to the degree that Wasserman Schultz becomes identified with Hillary Clinton, and to the, the degree to which Canova becomes... Bernie Sanders, if it becomes essentially a referendum on those two candidates, a proxy fight, yeah. well, it goes to Wasserman Schultz. The, that district voted 60 percent, 61 percent. I think even more. I think it was like 68-31 they for voted yeah. for Hillary Clinton in the 23rd CD. Correct. And so that, that's, that's difficult to beat. But again, if you pick the right opponent, it's important. Remember, Alan West was chased by Representative, now Representative Patrick Murphy, uh, yeah. who was from Miami. He ran against him in West Palm Beach. Alan West left that seat to run for another seat. Right. Patrick Murphy chased him there and beat him. Yeah. So and the numbers may not be in, um, in, his, in his favor, but the political environment certainly is this election cycle. So he'll, he'll benefit from that. But she's one of the, one of the hardest working Congress persons. She you know, she's um, visible in the district. Um, she's been leading the DNC through ups and downs. Um, and certainly this environment is something that she should pay attention to. Um, you know, so the challenge is good for her. I think it will make her stronger, actually. Yeah. I, I, I want to move maybe to a little unexpectedly for our producer, but Marvin, uh, you live in South Miami-Dade. Yes. And I think probably, is Carlos Curbelo your member of Congress? I think he may be. Anyway, here you've got a Republican who is in a newly drawn district that now is a majority Democrat in registration. Uh, what kind of a job do you think he's doing? Do you think he's, you know, he, he, he opposes Donald Trump? Well, that's good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but that won't get him elected. Uh, I don't know, it's a very, very difficult district with the changes that have been made down there. Yeah. Uh, but any um, strong incumbent uh, deserves a strong challenger. I'd, I'd like to see as much political turmoil in the House of Representatives races as possible, because I think it makes the, the House healthier. So I'm glad yeah. to see challenges across the board. Yeah, well, you have Annette Tadeo and Joe Garcia, the former member of Congress, who are both running for the Democratic uh, nomination down there. I don't know, Mark, who's got the upper hand in that race? Last time I predicted that Joe Garcia was going to win re-election, I was wrong. Carlos Curbelo beat him. I was also wrong about a North Florida congressional race as well. So I'm, 
I'm out of the predictions business. <laughs> but I have to say that is a very difficult seat for a Republican to hold. However, if a Republican is going to hold yeah. that seat in this election year, it's Carlos Curbelo, pro-gay rights, uh, pro-climate change action. Right. And immigration reform. reform. Yeah, right. he's he's. I think we've got most of the right positions for that district. But I it mean, might not matter. But it, it might. might it, it, it well, I think the matter. debate between Carbel, um, between Garcia and Tadeo is going to be a healthy one. You know, for August 30th, for people to pay very, very close attention right. to, because it it also looks at the temperature with, within the the Democratic Party as to where um, issues are leaning towards. Right. Well, I hope to have on this program before the uh, August primary, uh, have Annette Tadeo and Joe Garcia come and have a debate so people can can take a look. Um, Marvin, let's talk a little bit about national politics and uh, this meeting this week between uh, Donald Trump and uh, Paul Ryan, the uh, House Speaker. Uh, Ryan came out and said it was encouraging mm -hmm. and it was cordial, uh, but he didn't endorse him. No, he didn't. Well, you know, to me, the Republican Party reminds me of Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> you sat on the wall and had a great fall. And all the king's horses and all the king's men cannot put this Republican Party back together. Well, it's not going to be the same Republican Party, whatever gets put back together. Uh, that they're, we've seen. they're going to try, though, Professor. You know, um, Hillary Clinton may help them to glue the, the eggshells together for sure. Um, but uh, that's definitely going to be something to pay very close attention to as they go through this courtship, this GOP courtship over the yeah. summer. But having insulted so many people, having hurt so many feelings, having lost, I think, a lot of the base of the Republican Party. I don't see how the unification can take place. Actually, for a healthy country, we need to have two, two strong parties and two strong candidates. Uh, I'm not quite sure that we're going to emerge from this election uh, in, a, in a sound way as, as a country, feeling that we really had a healthy process. This has been so twisted and so perverted that I'm not quite sure that our process can, you know, can look back upon this, uh, this election and say that we had a healthy uh, process. Mark, uh, Paul Ryan, I think, at a Wisconsin State uh, Republican convention over the weekend yesterday, uh, told the Republicans here, oh, we are going to be united, but what else can he say? He's got to say this. Of course he does. I, I think to a degree there's some kabuki going on here. Uh, don't get me wrong, there are legitimate concerns within the Republican Party about Donald Trump. But if you're a party man, you know that if you want to hold on to some measure of power, as political parties want to do, they're organism seeking power just like any other organization, you're going to wind up backing the front runner. You're going to wind up backing your nominee. So right. I, it's kind of a fait accompli. What's going to be kind of interesting is just what a showman Donald Trump is. Yeah. I mean, we talk about him all the time. This yeah. is the first real reality show candidate. And when you look at the Republican National Convention that's going to happen, I mean, that's going to be kind of the greatest show on earth. Yeah. Well, July in Cleveland, I will be there. Glenna Milberg and I are going to be there for Local 10 News. Um, I don't know if you've had a time to look at your New York Times this morning. There is a big front page article about Donald Trump and the women oh, yes, in his it. life. Yes. Yeah, did you see that, Marvin? Yeah. And, it, it, you know, it sort of says, yes, he's been nice to some women, but with some other women, uh, he has been aggressive. He has been kind of a sexual predator, if you will. He's had been married three times. Uh, it's not a very flattering article. It is not. And who wants a president who has all of this baggage to be dragged out, as it will be during the course of this election and, and after? Uh, it was a very, very damaging article, right? I mean, a major piece in the New York Times today. Uh, but it may not stick. I mean, there may be yeah. folks who might admire But if there's him anyone who can use content. the media against this, as you say, this Kubica, um theater, as you call it, is, is Donald Trump. He's definitely tuned in to trying to manipulate how media well, and um, he succeeded his at manipulating uh, media. And then, Mark, uh, there was this fantastic story. The Washington Post gets this tape of Donald Trump pretending to be an aide, a, a PR spokesperson a number of years back in the 90s. Uh, and then he says, well, that's not me, but it is. It yeah, is. well, it's kind of like the Jedi mind trick from Star Wars. These are, <laughs> this is not my voice. These are not the, the droids you're looking for. The, uh, yeah, he called himself John Miller, and before that he called himself John Barron. This was right. exposed in the New York media at the time. Yeah. I, just a, in interest of balance, remember that though Donald Trump certainly has a lot of baggage, Hillary Clinton is not baggage-free as well. A Wall Street Journal wrote a really interesting piece about yeah. the, the various kind of connections, what some would call crony capitalism, right. between the Clinton Global Initiative and, and you know, the Clintons. Right. So what I do see, to your point, is a very negative election. When you have a very negative election, it usually depresses turnout. And when turnout's depressed, 
generally speaking, when there's a smaller turnout, it generally favors Republicans. So don't count Donald Trump out yet. He's got a variety of advantages that we don't talk about. All right, that's a good point in which to take a brief break. Stay with us. We'll be back with more Roundtable in a minute. Welcome back. Live in our studio this morning, our guests for the Roundtable, they are Mark Caputo of Politico, Dr. Marvin Dunn, and Marlon Hill, ace attorney. Uh, Dr. Dunn, let me ask you, uh, the Miami Herald published, I thought, a fascinating poll this week done by uh, uh, Ben Dixon and Amandi, mm -hmm. and it asked people, what really is on your mind? What's the most important issue? Tied at the top of the poll at 19% were jobs in the economy and youth gun violence. But when you look at the breakout there uh, among white people in Miami-Dade County, uh, something like, what, 3% said youth gun violence was really important to them, and among African Americans, it was like 38% said it was important, so it averaged out, but I mean, the disparity in what is important is, um, uh, it's just telling. Well, the white folks aren't getting shot. You don't have drive-by shootings in Coral Gables or some other areas. There's a very good reason why black people have uh, support for strong police, professional police, policing in our communities, because so many of us are victimized, uh, children are victimized. So there's going to be a greater sensitivity to this among blacks, and I'm not surprised that that poll is going to show just what mm -hmm. you said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's very telling to me as well. I mean, the, it was defi definitely marked with regards to the response of the caring about gun violence versus traffic and transportation. Um, I think this is going to be impact the mayor's race, you know. Right. Um, and this may be an opportunity for the mayoral candidates, you know, solve public safety and security right. in the black community, give us, give us an opportunity to be as prosperous as other communities, and you may be on your way. Right, and Mark, uh, I thought that the, the finding in the mayor's race in Miami-Dade, where uh, Carlos Jimenez, who's been in office for five years, uh, was really ahead of Raquel Regalado by, what, 13 points or something, uh, he, I would have thought he would have done better. Well, you know, it's a tough year for incumbents and professional politicians. You're going to hate me for going back to the original topic here. No, My wife is going to hate me for this. Uh, we live in Coral <laughs> Gables. She teaches at Tucker Elementary, which is in the West Grove. It's a very tough neighborhood, a poor black community. That school has experienced gunfire coming into the school. Yeah. Not out of it. The but other she day, she was in a portable one day. When, in fact, when one of her students, of, one of her students almost student. got shot. Yeah. Uh, and the other student, had he not been there, or better said, had he been there, he just happened to be sick that day. Probably would have been shot because he usually sat by the window. But the other day, she sent me a text message saying that her day day began this way. One of her students was walking to school, got hit by a car, rolled over the windshield. The police and the ambulance showed up, and guess what the ambulance did? They gave her two band aids and sent this poor shaking child on to school. Oh. The school then had to call the ambulance back, and then they took her to the hospital for a day. Like, so this is the way that a lot of black kids are being treated. So if you're black and you don't have insurance, you're going to have a tough time. So these are the daily challenges they face. Another student was pulled out because DCF had to take her and shove her into foster care. These are issues that we don't talk about probably enough, and I'm glad we're talking about it now. And those frustrations definitely come out. You know, the black population, as you know, is 20% and growing in Miami-Dade County. And in that poll, over 33% were undecided. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that percentage is a lot within the black community. I'm yeah. going to go back to Mark's point. Tuck Elementary School was the first job I had in Miami. When I really? came back in 1972, I started working at that school. And the sort of things you're talking about now, were happening at that time. The same sort of alienation within the community, those kinds of things were going on 35 years ago. It really makes you wonder how and how we can and why we haven't moved past some of these problems, uh, especially uh, the, the, the violence in the community. And the Maybe we'll learn a lot more here. with um, that book that you have coming out, Professor Dunn, with you know, Florida, seeing Florida through <laughs> the eyes of black people. And the book is, Marvin, tell us about the book. I have a new book coming out. It should be on Amazon in less than two weeks. Uh, the title is, a History of Florida Through Black Eyes. And I wanted to tell the story of the black presence in Florida from Ponce de Leon to the Miami Rights. And uh, the book will be available very soon. I'll put yeah. it up on my Facebook page when it is available. And that very, book would also good. tell us who will win the 29 electoral votes in, in, in November as well, because <laughs> Florida is going to be key. And the black, black population, both in central Florida and um, in south Florida, continues to grow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. If we can, let's move on, at least briefly. I, I want to talk, uh, ask you both uh, all about Zika. 
Because, um, uh, you know, Mark, I, I, this frustration, the approval ratings for Congress are, what, 11 percent or so. Can't get any worse. I mean, it is, it is uh, maybe even lower. And here we have a growing health crisis. Uh, Puerto Rico has, what, nearly 700 cases of Zika, one death. Uh, Florida is vulnerable. The Gulf Coast is vulnerable. And the president has asked for $1.9 billion, and he did it a number of weeks ago. It's not just the president. And, it's Bill Nelson. And, and it's Bill Marco Nelson Rubio. and Marco Rubio. And Congress has done nothing. Right. Well, mm -hmm. Congress, like all of us, reacts to crises and, de and deadlines. They don't see this as a crisis. They don't see it as a deadline. We have 109, 110 confirmed cases of Zika in Florida. The problem is the disease is apparently mutating. It, ca it causes microcephaly in children or in right. infants. Uh, the real scary thing outside of it spreading here is the fact that as Puerto Rico's economy continues to collapse and Congress does nothing about that, we're having on average a thousand families a month from Puerto Rico moving, moving to, to Florida. Florida. Maybe we need some um, Zika mosquitoes up in Congress. And I, you know, I, I, <laughs> I, I wonder too, I mean, this is now seen as kind of a Hispanic disease, his, hitting countries that have Hispanic right. populations. Olympics in the summer. Exactly. Now, suppose these, these populations were white. I think the response, I don't want to be uh, particularly cynical about it, but I wonder whether or not why the response you? would be cynical. No. Why not? We, you can be cynical. <laughs> well, you see, <laughs> with, right. you see with Congress talking about drugs, suddenly drug abuse is now yeah. a health problem. And when we're it was a black have, problem, it was a crime and, problem. And we're going to have a, a report in just a minute here about uh, the heroin and uh, phenytoin uh, mm -hmm. uh, problems here in Florida. Marlon, Marvin, Mark, thank you all for coming in. Thanks really so appreciate thank it. You. All right, so you have certainly heard about opioid, the epidemic in other parts of the country. Yes, it is here in South Florida, and we're going to have a report on it coming up next. Public health experts say powerful opioid drugs are taking hold across South Florida, including heroin, and these drugs are more dangerous than ever with deaths from overdoses more than doubling in the past year. Local 10 investigator Amy Viteri explains now how the prescription pill crackdown may have played a part. It's a deadly drug epidemic on the rise in South Florida. This outdoes the crack epidemic. This outdoes the cocaine epidemic. This drug and drugs are killing people. Heroin, often combined with an illicit version of the painkiller fentanyl. Epidemiologist Jim Hall says the opioid cocktails are more dangerous now than ever. This is a whole other demon and you can't get it off your back. Within minutes of riding along with Miami police, we found a heroin market right by a county government building. Alex Muniz showed us his needles and Kool-Aid he uses to taste when the drug hits his bloodstream. He says chronic back pain led to a prescription for the highly addictive painkiller OxyContin. When that ran out, he found heroin was cheaper and stronger. Without it, I get sick. I get withdrawals. I don't really get high anymore. I just get normal. But he knows the risks. People are dropping dead like flies from uh, fentanyl. Fentanyl, an opioid painkiller used as an anesthetic, is often illicitly produced in secret labs and mixed with heroin. Up to 100 times stronger than morphine, even small doses can kill. And addicts like Elizabeth know it. We don't know what we're putting in our arm. It's a very big risk. From 2014 to 2015, in Broward County, fentanyl deaths increased 49 percent. Heroin deaths jumped 186 percent. In Miami-Dade, fentanyl deaths jumped 363 percent, and deaths from heroin doubled. But why now? Experts say Florida's crackdown on prescription painkillers cut off supply, but didn't address addictions left behind. But at the same time, they failed to increase treatment opportunities. There are long waiting lists and people can't wait. Open drug use seen here in video from Miami police means officers have to arrest people many say need a doctor, not a jail. Put the syringe down. And we were with police in late April when they found a man dead of a suspected overdose, the needle still in his arm. If you know of a dealer whose bag killed someone, you're gonna go to that dealer because theirs is the strongest. 21-year-old Julia Cannon is five months into recovery. Before that, she was a college student. It doesn't discriminate. It will get you. It will get anybody. I was introduced to it in my high school, or wealthier area, mm -hmm. you know, and people are all of a sudden shocked that their kids are dying from heroin overdoses. I graduated from college. I was an athlete. Great family. Like, I couldn't ask for better parents. Paul says that's the profile for today's heroin addicts, many of them young moms. Young adults, 
primarily white, uh, both Hispanic and non-Hispanic, often from middle class and suburban neighborhoods. The path to heroin almost always prescription pills. I had a C-section and they prescribed me Percocet. When Dina Rash's prescription ran out, she found heroin. I left my daughter when she was 18 months old, and I have not seen her to this day. Rash isn't allowed contact with her daughter, who is now in middle school. She's now raising her second daughter and works at a recovery center to help others steer clear of the deadly risk too many are willing to take. That's how we see it. So we're going to do what we have to do to feed the monster. Another disturbing trend, just last month the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office says nine people died taking counterfeit Xanax and oxycodone pills that were made with fentanyl. Amy Viteri, Local 10 News. Amy, thanks. And according to health and law enforcement officials, much of the illegal fentanyl and its chemi chemically similar compounds are manufactured in China and Mexico before they are smuggled into the U.S. All right, so to come, my personal perspective about a gutsy decision by the man you see here, Judge Milton Hirsch, regarding the death penalty. Now here is a live look from our Hollywood Beach cam and here also to tell us about the weather for this afternoon and tomorrow, Jennifer Correa. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Michael. Good afternoon, South Florida. It doesn't look too bad to head out to the beach. You can still do it. Just use that sunscreen, drink plenty of water. A couple of clouds already building over parts of Miami-Dade County. Of course, with that daytime heating, we'll see a couple more clouds building, but basically partly sunny for this afternoon. Highs already reaching those mid to upper 80s. Wind still turning out of the northeast, anywhere between 5 to 10 miles per hour. No rain on the radar, but that doesn't mean we can't have an inland shower later this afternoon. There's a stalled boundary right over central Florida. We're expecting it to stay where it is. I, of course, that's what it means. It's a stationary front. It will become breezier by tomorrow once that high pulls away from the mid Atlantic. And again, today's high 87 degrees getting into the seven day forecast. We keep it quiet for tomorrow. Still a chance for an isolated shower and then rain chances start to go up on Tuesday. Michael Jennifer, thanks. All right. Before we leave you this morning, a personal perspective about a courageous and I think correct legal ruling on Florida's death penalty. Miami-Dade Judge Milton Hirsch ruled earlier this week that Florida's revised death penalty law just doesn't pass constitutional muster. Hirsch says the jury's decision to execute a convicted murderer has to be unanimous. The judge is right. The long and short of this is pretty simple. Judge Hirsch said to put someone to death, you need all 12 jurors to say so, to agree. He says anything less is unconstitutional. The state legislature this year said 10 jurors was enough. And about that, Judge Hirsch wrote this. He said arithmetically, the difference between 12 and 10 is slight, but the question before me is not a question of arithmetic. It is a question of constitutional law. It is a question of justice. Since justice is the goal, then all 12 jurors should agree whether a person should serve life in prison or be put to death. I personally don't believe in the death penalty. I don't believe that it is a deterrent and it amounts to the state responding to a heinous and excusable crime with one of its own. I have been to state and federal prisons many times and believe me, spending the rest of one's life in one of those is a terrible punishment. Judge Hearst's decision will be appealed, ultimately, probably decided by the Florida Supreme Court, maybe even the U.S. Supreme Court. I hope Judge Hirsch is upheld. If it takes all 12 jurors to decide if someone has committed murder, it should take all 12 jurors to sentence that person to death. That is my perspective for this week. Hope you have a wonderful Sunday. It will be a lot happier if the Heat pull off another Game 7 victory this afternoon. It's a game you can see only on Channel 10. We will have pregame coverage starting at 2.30. The tip-off is at 3.30. Go Heat! And remember, as always, stay informed, get involved. We'll see you back here again next Sunday.